Welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. Today's lesson is on social stratification, population and development. I am Orville Beckford, your teacher for today. Welcome. Social stratification is one of those courses that are for both CAPE Sociology and CAPE Caribbean Studies. It is important that you understand the concepts given the last thing that we heard from, um, from CXC with respect to a lot of um, MCQs, multiple choice questions. It is now important that you understand the concepts very well because although multiple choice questions seem very easy, but you either know the concept or you don't know the concept. So it is important that you pay attention to the definitions and to the various concepts. So we start first by saying that um, a definition of stratification so it's a, a ranking, systematic ranking of individuals who, whose positions are treated as superior, equal, or inferior. We said that social stratification is a process by which individuals and groups are ranked hierarchically one above the other. Important that you understand, because there's nothing to sort. So um, it is um, in society or individuals and groups are ranked one above the other by some social basis. This social basis can be class, race, color, gender, geography, um, you name it. Um, there are many, 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 many bases of social stratification. So that's the definition. So we, we start out by saying that we have an open system and a closed system of social stratification. When you speak of a closed system, of social stratification. We're speaking of one in which you can't move between from one strata to the next. When we speak of an open system, we say that there's free movement from one strata to the next. Now, we seldom have a purely open system or a purely closed system. We generally say it's relatively closed or relatively open. So a relatively open system is one in which you can move from one strata to the next, but there may be issues social issues. And so a relatively closed system, which more mirrors what we have in the Caribbean, we speak about you being able to move from one strat stratum to the next. But of course, there are social issues like race, class, color, that doesn't make this movement all that fluid and easy. So we're looking at a couple social stratification system. One is estate. We really don't have that here again. This was European society during the medieval time um, where position um, was defined by law and membership primarily determined by inheritance. We kind of do have that here, that's medieval Europe. A caste system, this of course was what they had in um, pre-colonial India, Indian society, in which you had um, different castes, and so the caste at the top was what was called the Brahmins. But this social stratification was by religious purity, not money. So it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you're at the bottom of the caste, then um, you are still at the bottom of the caste. Whether you are a billionaire or a trillionaire, you just remain at the bottom of the class. So at, at the top of the class was the Brahmin, who were the most religiously pure. And so they were followed by, by the Shastris, they were followed by the Sudras, and down at the, the end, we have the untouchables who were considered to be out of caste, which is why where the term out caste came from, you were out of caste. So then we have the class system. This is what we have in Jamaica. Class is one of those, those type of ranking that seem simple, but have serious social implications. Um, in, and class tend to be economic. So the PRJ will put out each year um, where does the lower class stop in terms of income or the lack thereof, the middle class, the upper class, but it has serious social implication. So it says, though the system is most open, there are some restrictions that in the mobility between classes. For example, in the Caribbean education, race, color, and to a lesser extent, gender. Social mobility. Generally, when we speak about stratification, one of the issues that will always be at... Um, at the forefront of questions is social mobility. Do we have pure social mobility in the Caribbean? Are we free to move from one stratum to the next? And what are some of the, the issues that hinder that social mobility? We have horizontal 
and vertical social mobility. Horizontal mobility, of course, you're moving across the, the spectrum. So it's one social position to another at the same level. So for example, a manager at one of our commercial banks could be transferred from Brownstone to say um, Crossroads, and that would be considered horizontal mobility. Now, if you have a supervisor in the bank who have been promoted to a manager, then you know that that is vertical mobility. So we can say that through society in terms of horizontal and vertical mobility. Now, this is the one that pay attention because of course, these are the things of which uh, multiple choice questions are made. Intergenerational mobility. Inter suggests between generations. So for example, my father, um, perhaps was poor, but I'm in the middle class, just hypothetically. Um, and so that's inter, as we move from one generation to the next, um, there is mobility. But there's also intra-generational mobility. You were born poor, you were, you were born in the lower class, but you have um, achieved your cape, move on to university, did well, did your master's, and now you're doing very well as a, as a manager of a bank. And so that will be intra. You, the same person, has moved from one level to the next level. So the, um, there are other issues with respect to social stratification, but it is important that you understand the zero social theories surrounding social stratification. Very important. So we start with the functionalists. Remember again, we did that last time, that for functionalism, they see society as being in social order and the various social institutions um, operate or exist to maintain that social order. So to, for, the, for the functionalist, stratification is the ranking of units in a social system. Um, and so they see social stratification as, as being part of the consensus in society, that this is what society wants. So an individual's rank in society is perceived as the reward punishment for the level of work done that we can argue about whether that is really how we rank people, that's how you get a promotion, that's how, that's how you get a job. Is it really that um, because of your level of work or other issues? And so stratification functions for them to unify the society and to integrate the various groups. And so issues like power and prestige and, and those issues will always come in between um, to decide how fast you move, how fast you, 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 you get a promotion, and what you do with it. So functionally, such as Davis and Moore, we call them um, Kingsley Davis and, and Moore, and Wilbur Moore, they are the ones who are saying that for, for, for social stratification, the, the, the individuals with the highest qualification get the best jobs. Um, that's how it seems if we speak of a purely what we call meritocratic system. A purely meritocratic system is where you, um, you, you, you move up by merit, not by anything else, but by merit. So for example, if you are at school and the person who gets an A would have gotten the A by merit. We assume you had the best essays or you did well on the exam. And so, so a purely meritocratic system would have been uh, um, what David Samori is speaking about. Now we can argue whether in the Caribbean, we have a purely meritocratic system. If you finish university with a first class honors, does it mean that you will get a job very quickly rather than someone who's just finishing with a past degree? Um, do we have that type of meritocratic system? Because David Samori is saying that once you, you, you are qualified, the most qualified people get the best jobs. They also went on to say the reason why doctors and lawyers um, are paid so much and have so much prestige it is because um, they spend a long time at university, at university doctors for five years, um, lawyers also too for five years. And so they are saying that they are rewarded for spending that much time on their lessons, that much time qualifying themselves. So when they're finished, they are rewarded with prestige and, uh, and of course, higher pay. Doctors may complain as to whether they are really getting higher pay. So they say society is based on a set of functions, a functional prerequisite which must be met in order for society to survive. We went through that the last time, where we're saying that um, you must 
in terms of um, to survive, you must integrate and you must have pattern maintenance. So it says stratification ensures this by maintaining that all roles within society are filled by persons who are adequately trained and best suited for them. We wish it was so. That is the ideal meritocratic system that if you're in a role, you have been properly trained for that role. Just as persons differ in their talents and, and ability, so too do position different in terms of their importance. Of course, because the importance isn't necessarily has to do with the level of the job. Because we are seeing now that what is very important now is that um, the garbage collector, very important. The, um, the nurses, very important. The, the, the taxi people, the food people, these are little people who we never thought of before now that their jobs were very important. The domestic helper. And so importance is relative. So we speak of relative importance of jobs. The Marxists now. Now, again, we always go historically just to remind you that we have to think of Marxism and, and Marxist concept within, within the context of the period in which Karl Marx lived, which is 1818 to 1883. During, during that period, society was divided into just two sets of people, the have and the have not. So um, there are two major groups within the stratified group, the ruling class and the subject class, what we call the bourgeoisie, the upper class, and the proletariat, which is the lower class. And um, there's constant conflict, animosity, and exploitation. That is Marx, that is conflict theory. And there's a dependency between the classes as each depends on the other for survival. Yes, we do. So we are saying now that what we are seeing now is that there's a greater dependence now on the proletariat. Because even if you have a um, million dollars US in your account and you are you tested positive with, for COVID-19, the money can't help you. Um, you have to depend on one, perhaps a taxi man to carry to the hospital. Two, for uh, a porter at the hospital to wheel you in um, for a nurse to look after you. And a lot of people who, um, it's not a case of your money and so on and so forth. So, um, so, so it is important because we depend on each other for that kind of survival. So um, again, to, for Marx, notice just two. The haves, the have-nots. For Weber, Weber again historically lived longer than Marx into industrial society. Because um, Weber lived um, again 1864 to 1920. So he was aware of the advent of industrial society. So things started to change um, up until the time when he lived. And so, which is why he saw stratification somewhat different from that of Marx. So for Weber, Weber said that there were four uh, different ranks within the society. There was the property class, that's what we call the bourgeoisie. The, prop the propertyless white collar worker, these are like we call the civil servants. And the petty bourgeoisie, these are people who sell on the street, people who have their own local shop or own local supermarket. And then there's the manual working class, or who we call the proletariat. Notice that um, uh, Marx just had two, upper class, lower class, bourgeoisie, proletariat, Weber, a longer stretch. He now introduced two, <clears throat> two middle classes, um, the, the propertyless white collar worker and the petty bourgeoisie. Because by the time um, he, he was writing, he had now seen European society um, not being just um, that bicameral in terms of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, but now there were people who had started to work, who were now able to send them children to decent school, they were able to buy houses, and so on and so forth, and now could live, um, could move up from the lower class to the middle class. So which is why it's so important that for Weber, um, social stratification meant a longer tier in terms of the different classes. Now, now, it is important for us to understand social stratification within the Caribbean context. Very important. Again, plantation society. This is where we got our system of social stratification. Some people said, how? Oh. Because again, remember, plantation society started from the beginning of slavery, which is 1506, 07, 08, somewhere there right up until slavery ended 1834 and we had emancipation 1838. So plantation society was all we knew in the Caribbean for almost 350 years. So this is where our social assistance stratification came from. 
uh, plantation society. So on, on the plantation, we had the whites at the top, the mulattoes in the middle, and the blacks. Of course, remember, the, the mulattoes were children, were born to white male parents and black mothers. Um, in most cases, it was due, due to rape. So, uh, of course, we had the blacks at the end, and the Indians were added later ju um, during indentureship. So this was what we had. And if you think of it, this really hasn't changed much in modern-day Caribbean society. We still have the whites at the top, followed by the, what we call the browning class, the mulattoes, and followed by the blacks at the end of the spectrum. Of course, we, people say, but I know some people who are so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, yes, some have moved up and so on, but I will have you know that that upper class tier of white, that class is not by money, but it, it is by, by ascription. So we in, in the Caribbean is stratified by class, status, power, race, ethnicity, color, gender, education. This is just a few. We are also stratified by geography. Depending on where you live, there are certain jobs that you can get and will not get, believe it or not. And so we say that you are stratified by geography. Also, when you are from certain areas, there are certain stigma attached to you, um, whether you want to or not. So we stratify by class, by status, by power, by race, ethnicity, by color, gender, and education. Now, it is important that you understand these concepts, because these are the things of which multiple choice questions are made in terms of class, status, power, race, ethnicity. Um, it's not that they are interchangeable. You have race and you have ethnicity. Because race has to do with your phenotype, how you look. And we have a, uh, you either black or you white. Our concept of, uh, of browning for the American um, is, not, uh, is not white. So it does matter. Unless you are European with that phenotypically European look, you're not white, plain and simple and so on and so forth. And so um, ethnicity, of course, these are characteristics of which a group think, uh, the group think it is relevant, that these characteristics are relevant um, to the individual. So you can't just come and say, I am part of the, um, of the Indian ethnic group. No, if you don't have characteristics that are relevant to being an Indian, then you're not part of that group. And so the issue of gender, it's very difficult to discuss social stratification without discussing, discussing gender. Very important. Why? Because gender is part of our everyday life now in terms of how women are treated compared to how men are treated. Not that this never used to happen before, but what you to me is that uh, we never discuss women. The, the thinking was that women should stay at home. That was the initial thinking. Thank God we have passed that. And so what we have now is that women are now out in the workplace and equally qualified for, for positions um, as men. We used to believe that there are certain jobs that were gender-based. So for example, if I said to you that um, your school tomorrow, an engineer is coming to discuss um, the, 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 the architecture position with you, um, who would you expect? Most of you say, me sir, me teacher, me teacher. We expect a male. But we have some fascinating and very um, creative architects that are female but we tend to think along that line, that because it's, um, it's an architect, it's a man. If I said to you that, uh, that uh, a physicist is coming to your school tomorrow, of course you start to think a male person is coming. But if I say a nurse is coming, you start to think that a female is coming because we associate that kind of gender-based uh, um, profession and so on. But that is all changing. We do see men now going into nursing. In fact, in America, about 30% of the nurses in America are male. In Jamaica, we are a little slow. We have less than 5%, but you know, we, are, we are getting there. But we are also seeing female there at UTEC doing architecture, doing engineering. And so we're removing this stereotype of thinking that we have this type of stratification by, by profession and so by, by, um, by gender, because females will do this and males will do that. Um, both males and females can do just about everything except having children. And the female can, the male still can't. We, we have reached yet, yet scientifically. I put a diagram here so you can see social stratification back at, in the 19th century and to where we are now. If you notice, the lower class um, very few lower class could make it to the middle class. In fact, part of the issue had to do with education. As you know, 
the English came into Jamaica, they took over from, from the Spanish um, in 1655. The first university, which was the University of the West Indies, started in 1948. You can do the maths to see how long, 298 years before a university was developed. So consequently, a few people who wanted a degree had to go to England or America. And so we have very few people in the middle class um, due to the, the, the lack of educational opportunities. So we never started having tertiary institutions on this island until 1948. The British been here from 1655, so you can do the maths. And so over time, as in present day system, we see that we have more blacks, um, or more people from the lower class being able to, to, to socially mobile into the middle class. And of course, um, we see where some of the middle class, but of course, this is mainly some of the Brownings that have gone into the upper class. But we still would say that in the Caribbean, we are, the, the stratification system is partially open. Um, some people even say it is partially closed. How we define a, a, a closed system is that when you die in the same stratum in which you are born, and there are still some people who born in the middle class will die in the middle class, born in the lower class will die in the lower class. That means that for them, the system was a closed stratification system. There is no, there is no mobility from one class to the next. Jamaica. Um, each strata in society reflects a different cultural grouping, and this is aligned to skin color. We don't talk about it much, but we do have that social stratification by skin color. Of course, it is reflected in people um, doing what we call skin bleaching, thinking that it gives them socially a better opportunity for upward social mobility. Um, that's up for discussion um, if you want to see me outside. The only vertical mobility that occurred was the blacks moving from lower class to middle class. Um, was that where they plateaued? Yes. Because to get into the, the, the upper class was by ascription. You should know what I mean by achievement and ascription. When you have achievement, so you, you, you have social mobility because you have, you have achieved a university degree, um, you're a sports athlete that have done very well, or so on. Um, ascription are things that you're born with. So if you're born white, it is assumed automatically that you're in the upper class, even if you're poor like a church mouse. So industrialization resulted in the widening of the economy, increased job creation, and thus the emergence of new classes. Like I said, with respect to Weber, he was seeing more of an industrial society unfolding. So he saw more of a middle class emerging than Marx who did not see a middle class. So as industrialization continues, we see more and more blacks getting better opportunities for education, better opportunities for housing, and so could then send their children to better schools. And so we argue as to whether we agree or disagree with M.G. Smith. According to Derek Gordon, Derek Gordon was a university sociologist. Um, he, he said that um, between 1943 and 1984, there was a significant upward movement to the middle and upper classes. The higher managerial and professional group showed an increase in black representation from 20% in 1943 to 42% in 1984, and no doubt has gone past that. Because what we are seeing is that as education opportunities become open and more available to lower class blacks, then they can move into the middle class and, um, and we find some even moving to the, um, to the tip of the upper class because education is very important as a means of social mobility. Um, it doesn't guarantee your social mobility, but what it does is give you the opportunity for social mobility, which is why we keep saying to you students, stay in school, even if you plan to become a DJ, stay in school, even if you plan to become a, um, a runner, stay in school. Because after running and, and you don't have it anymore, it's for a DJ, what happened? And so it's important in terms of your social mobility, your educational level. Uh, it was also Derek Gordon who said that it is very difficult for the son or daughter of a farmer to become a doctor or a lawyer. People said, like, seriously, in this time? And we said, yes, we're still seeing it. Uh, uh, one, the, if you're a farmer, it's hard for your children or child to get student loan. Um, unless you can find somebody who will co-make it for you, um, it is, or somebody in the church, it is going to be difficult. 
Okay, so you now come to university. Um, if you get into the first core at UW to be a doctor, that is what we call the UDC funded one. Um, that one will, will perhaps run you for the year, um, perhaps $750,000. If you get into the other one, then it's about two point something million. Uh, it's very difficult. And we keep seeing more and more children from the lower class having difficulties paying their fees because, of course, there's, um, they didn't get student loan and the mother and father can't afford it. And so, um, although this was done from 87 by Derek Garden, we still see the same thing happening now, where it is still very difficult for the daughter or son of a farmer to become a doctor or a lawyer. Yes, we know there are two, one and two cases that is now done. You see it on, 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 on TVJ interview on a Sunday afternoon with Faye. Um, but those are the exceptional. We wish that it would be the norm that once you are qualified, once you have the brilliance, then you can become a doctor or a lawyer. But there are social stratification issues. In this, this one is money, um, why it prevents a number of people from the lower class becoming doctors and lawyers. Brathwaite. Of course, Brathwaite is, is considered the father of Caribbean sociology. He says, said, society largely defined by race. White good, black evil. Every time that there's a movie, the devil is black. Ever wonder why? Why the devil can't be white? Um, it's just a little strange, you know? Um, I remember that during my time at Casey, for, um, I did Huckleberry Finn and, um, and Tom Sawyer. In both of those books, there was just one black man. In one, he was full fool, or mad. Um, and the next one, he was a thief. Um, strange, because this is how it was portrayed during those times in terms of our British education. Thank God for, um, for CXC. Um, once CXC started in 1983, the first text that they used was old story time, Trevor Roan. And you could see yourself, uh, you could understand your own identity. But um, there is this issue of, of white good, um, black evil. He said, Syrians, Asians, and the Chinese maintain their status by keeping a relatively close system, um, except for, for intermarriage and white grouping. The Indians and Chinese, the real East Indian and Chinese, don't like to intermarry. So, um, so they marry to each other. They marry to Chinese, marry to Chinese, Indian, marry to Indian. We see in Trinidad where that is changing with respect to the Indians, because we now see Indians and, um, and blacks marrying, and so what you get is what you call a Dougal. So we say we see the Dougalization of Trinidadian society. Um, so Selwyn Ryan, 30 years later, notes that Bradford's system of stratification has virtually disappeared, especially with the rise um, of the black, blacks to power in terms of the PNM. The PNM is the party in Trinidad that is, um, is really mainly blacks, and you have, you have the UNC which is mainly Indian. So you always have the social stratification where I know it gone to politics. So wherever you go, and so Selwyn Ryan is saying that no, in Trinidad, no, uh, it is a little different now because you now have black political parties, the PNM, that has challenged for power and have one power more than once. So we move on to Rodok, uh, um, Redok, Rhoda Redok. Again, she's one of the, the, the people who writes on gender. She knows that gender has become a more important factor in distinguishing groups in the society. Of course, um, though female participation in the labor force remains relatively lower than men, there's evidence of them experiencing gr greater um, mobility across all ethnic groups. In fact, one of the things that we have in Jamaica now and most of the Caribbean is that most of the managers are female. Believe it or not, most of the managers are female. Um, we see less male managers. There are many different reasons for it. Uh, one of which is they, we speak about the, the in, in terms of male, male marginalization. A lot of the youth are on the street corner doing this, uh, rubbing out a, um, a, a spliff in the middle, middle of their hands. That, that's what we are seeing. They're not in school. A study that was done by Herbert Gale at UW also found that a lot of the, the men who are in the street corner that are paying for women who are in university. So they will send their women to, um, to university, but they stay on the street corner and turn watch list. And so, so what we are seeing is that when it comes for, for um, employees, employers to pick a, a field of workers, 
there are more women to pick from than there are men. But there are also other issues in terms of social stratification. Under the British system of education, we had twice as many all-girls school as all-boys school. And it wasn't coincident. So if you, if you look back, you can do the maths. And all the standard schools that are all-girls school, there are twice as many compared to the all-boys school. And that has colonial, um, colonial origins. And so that's it in terms of uh, social stratification. Again, remember, uh, MCQs mainly for CXE, which means that you need to understand the concepts. You need to understand, um, be able to explain them. There's nothing to swat. And so you need to be able to explain the concept. So bear in mind, our own stratification system came from plantation society, George Beckford Plantation Society, whites at the top, the mulattoes in the middle, and blacks at the end, later to be joined by Indians. So we now move on to population. If you notice, I always start with the, with the syllabus. Why? There are too many times students believe that it's a teacher's responsibility to, to finish the syllabus. Given all that is happening now with COVID-19, it is going to be difficult. So what it means, that some of the, the, the syllabus have been done on your own. So which is why I always pick out of the, the, the CAPE syllabus and put, on, put online where you can see it, what is expected of you. So what we have here comes straight up, pick it out of the syllabus to show you these are the concepts that you should be able to complete before you have the exam. So we have concept of crude birth rate, crude death rate, fertility rate, life expectancy, population growth, dependency ratio, and so on and so forth. And so these are some of the things that you must know how to define each of these. You must know how to work out crude birth rate, crude death rate, fertility rate, and, and natural increase, and so on. Because it's important, especially for your MCQ, that to be able to do this quickly. Because you, um, you do have a long time to sit down and work on, to, to decide how to work out these, these problems. So then we'll also look on the sociological perspective of population. Again, this is coming straight out of the syllabus, the CAPE syllabus, the Malthusian. So when you're getting ready now for exam, you should have said, okay, I, I, I now know about the, the Malthusian perspective, the Marxist perspective, the Neo-Malthusian, and the demographic transition. I suppose to know all of those. And with respect to the issue of um, population policy, birth control, what type of policy we have, migration, if we have any, food security and housing because of course these are social issues that are very important with respect to population so of course we have simple definition of population these are all the people living in a particular area so all the people living in kingston with the population of kingston all the people living in jamaica will be the population of jamaica um, we speak of population later on when we come to the social research for those of you doing the sba but, um, but we'll speak to that um, at that time. Demography, is, it sounds like a big word, but it's, it's not a big word. It's concerned with everything that influences or can be influenced by the population, size, distribution, process, structure, characteristics. So when people said, um, you, you are to fill out a, a survey, make sure you fill out the demographic part. That's the part I'm gonna ask you for your age, last birthday, we're going to ask you for things like perhaps where you live, level of education that have been completed, and all of those. All of those are demographic issues. Issues to offer whether you're male or female, um, you're, you are to indicate. Um, I see some people put gender and say must male or female, but gender is socially constructed. So we leave work whether at home or in organization. Some will have children, some will marry, some will divorce, some will migrate, we will all die. And these are all issues relating to demography, all of these. So when we start to think of demography, we start to think of all of these factors. And so all of these factors will be somewhere within the syllabus on demography. So I've indicated here. Now, the, I have two books here just to show you in terms of when it comes on to Cape sociology, it is important that you... We have this one by Chinapu et al. and others. Um, very good text in terms of Unit 2 especially. Uh, it also have Unit 1, but Unit 2. And we also have another one by Jennifer Mohammed. 
also a very good text in terms of Unit 2. So issues like population, issues like poverty, crime and deviance, and so on. Again, both of them contain information on Unit 1. But I'm saying to you, in terms of a, a Caribbean perspective, on population, on crime and deviance, and so on, these are the two texts which are the most important. So these are very simple calculations um, in terms of crude birth rate and number of live birth per thousand um, in, over the number of people in the country. So similar with crude death rate, um, number of deaths in a year over number of people in the country, time a thousand. Fertility rate, note the number of live births over the number of females aged 15 to 49. They assume that that is the, the, the childbearing age, but I've known people who have children even when, uh, no lady had a child when she was 62 and so on, but it's just that on the, on the ordinary, um, the female fertility age range is generally from 15 to 49. Now, why is it necessary for us to know these? So it's one thing to know how to calculate it, but two, why are we interested in the birth rate? Because we need to know how the country is doing with respect to um, certain age range. And so, um, is it that the country is having a lot of uh, children? Because there was a time when we, th we think that we're having uh, um, population explosion. Again, what is this related to? Food, when you come to Malthusian theory, you'll understand. We shouldn't be having population that outstrip um, the, 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 the amount of food that we have. If you have a runaway birth rate, then of course it means that over time, we'll have more people than we have food to feed those people. And so hunger and famine are things that will, um, will, will come in. Of course, there are other issues. Of course, when people can't get food, then a lot of other social issues will come up. And the crude death rate, uh, again too, um, we want to know if are the people of the country dying um, at a particular rate? Uh, are we seeing an increase in the death rate? Of course, if your country has, um, in terms of the structure of the population, older people and, a, and a, a, a disproportionate amount of older people, then you expect that your death rate will increase. Um, just like um, issues that we're interested in as well is life expectancy. To what age do people in the country live until? Women have a higher um, life expectancy than men. But overall, in Jamaica and most Caribbean islands, we have a good life expectancy that, that tend to mirror that of the developed countries. Uh, demographic estimates of, of population. Here we want to know what is the population at a point in time. For those of you students, you should know that we have a census every 10 years. The last one was um, 2001. So most of the information that we have, that we use is from, in Jamaica, is from that census. But there's also uh, um, from the Statin and POJ, the survey of living condition. You can look it up. Um, it's free on those um, websites, the survey of living condition, that also gives you a number of information on the population and a number of demographic information. But our last census was 2001, the 2011. We expect another one in terms of 2021. And so, um, so it's important. So we need to know in terms of what's the population at, at a point in time. So here um, we have P being the most recent known population, um, P1, P2 the current population, and so on and, and so forth. Um, we'll come back to B minus D, birth minus death, and immigration minus emigration. So it's important that you understand and be able to define immigration different from emigration. So the, the, the population equation, again, the population will be equal to birth minus death, which you can understand, plus immigration minus emigration. So of course we have birth, death, but there are people who will uh, immigrate into our country. And there are people in our country that will immigrate to, uh, emigrate to other countries. And so that's why we have them added at the end. Of course, we move on now to the the perspective on population. I know some of you students will find it a little, a little, a little difficult um, to understand Maltos 
and Neo Malthusian theory. But we have to stick with them because it's part of the syllabus, so we have to understand. Um, population size will soon outstrip food. That was his thinking. That if we have this runaway population explosion, then over time it will outstrip the food supply, um, which will correct itself naturally through, notice what he said, through starvation, like seriously, war and diseases. Um, so he's saying that it will correct itself over time. Now, one can argue whether he's correct or incorrect, but of course, but if you think of it, then people, a student once said to me, um, Dr. Beckford, why is it that the we, um, some of the large areas like China and India, when they're there are issues when there are catastrophe, they are on such a large scale. I say we come back to Malthusian theory that when um, the, the population is trying to correct itself, we have a lot of things um, in, in those countries. Other issues are birth control um, and should the unemployed person eat food? Um, that's according, according to Malthus. He's saying that if you're not earning money, then you shouldn't eat food. Like, seriously? Um, we're not so wicked as a civilization. We are, we are not so wicked, no, we're not at all. So we'll feed those who are not working until they can work. But there are some people who are not working, not for no fault of theirs, they are, um, they are disabled or, um, or, or had a stroke or whatever it is, and so on. But for Malta's theory, if they're not working, they should need food, and so on. And so there are, and there are other issues of birth control where they think that you should limit the population um, with forced birth control. There's nothing wrong with birth control, but we don't think it should be forced on people. So neo Malthusian theory, the population will outstrip food, uh, as a food supply, but this can be corrected using eugenesis. That is a term which is, we don't like it, um, with selective breeding. So what we are saying is that we should only ensure that a particular type is, is bred, um, whether Europeans, whether Italians, or whatever it is, which, um, which flies in the face of, um, of, of we think, of God's, God's, God's word, and that I, I, um, I'm free to, to have my child and should be limited to just one child because I'm from the ghetto. Because this is what they're talking about, selective breeding, which can be seen as racist and classist, and so on. Um, and so there's also Planned Parenthood. Um, for those of you, you hear the term on American TV daily about Planned, planned Parenthood. This is when you plan for your, your children. And so I'm just going to have two children. And so, so that is your plan. But what happens if you get pregnant a third time? Um, there are a lot of issues that will come up with respect to that Planned Parenthood. Because if you're sticking to it slavishly, what do you do with that third child? We see populations such as China and Japan limiting families to just, it was three child, there are three children, then two children, and now one and a half children. Oh, you mean one and a half children? Yes, uh, um, in terms of overall, just one. And so um, how is this done? By forced means, some of which we would rather not see here in the Caribbean, and so on. And so um, uh, 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 Margaret Sangner, and, 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 and Anne Besant were seen as writing about preventing pregnancy or contraception. Um, of course, this is a very um, topical issue because whether you, you prevent pregnancy or what to do after the pregnancy, these are issues that are part of population discussion. And, um, and contraceptive, do you force people? Because there, um, there was a time when there were thoughts of, uh, do you remember in which country? that they, they are saying that the poor people should be forced to use contraceptive, should be forced to, uh, um, to limit their families, and so on. So, so these are always very topical issues that are very controversial. Uh, the Marxists, you always can predict what the Marxists will do or say. Uh, capitalist society are not trying to control population growth as large population are needed for capitalist society, labor force, and also as surplus labor to keep wages down. Um, you can understand the, 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 the reason of it, but the rationality, uh, not so sure. So they are saying that we allow um, the third world to have large population, very large population, because when you have large population, then it provides uh, um, labor force for developed countries. 
And also, too, when you have a large population, so many people running down the same job, you can keep wages down. So we can understand the Marxist view as to whether this is what happens in the Caribbean. Then we can always have a discussion in terms of critical thinking on that. Demographic transition theory. Now, this is the popular one that you'll be asked questions on over and over and over. So I'll spend some time on it with you. Um, so it's characteristic of, so it is in stages. Most books have four stages. So we'll have five, but most books will have four stages. Um, the fifth stage is contemporary society now, which is why some books don't refer to it as stage five. So stage one, prior to 1700, again, we always go historical so we can understand what is happening in society at the time. Um, characteristic of pre-industrial society, we speak of the coming into the 19th century as industrial society, which is 1801, the 19th century started 1801. Birth rates are high because there's no birth control or family planning, and there's high rates of infant mortality. Because, of course, um, the, the technology and the medicine and so on wasn't done to, to, to ensure that women would carry the pregnancy and then deliver uh, um, a healthy child. There's high birth rate. Our facility is countered by high, high death rate caused by famine, poor nutrition, plague disease. Again, um, this period now of COVID-19, forced us to go back and look at the Black Plague of 1918, in which um, some, I think, one point something million people died. But before that, we, um, um, we had, no, the, the, it, it was swine, swine flu was 1918. The Black Plague was somewhere in the 15th century, and some five point something million people died. So it's not the first that we have plagues um, that result in a lot of people dying. We are hoping that for COVID-19, we won't see those levels um, of, of death. But of course, um, during that period, again, prior, prior to 1700, we would have had a black plague. And so we, um, we had a whole, a whole huge amount of the population dying. Um, there were famine, poor nutrition again, because um, we hadn't developed the technology in which to expand food production so it could feed the countries that didn't have um, enough acreage to plant things. And for the Caribbean, um, you'll keep seeing this for the, uh, each of the stage. For the Caribbean, early stages of slavery is through to post-emancipation. So nothing happened. Um, it, well, it just remained the same. Slavery, high birth rate, um, but high death rate. They, uh, they wanted high birth rate so they could have more slaves. And so some of the men were used as studs just to provide more children. All right, um, stage two, natural increase in population due to high birth rate. But we start to see a decline um, in the death rate and infant mortality. Again, we've seen um, improvement in medical um, development, technology, vaccination, and so. So therefore, we're able now to keep down the death rate. We also had enhanced transportation. That means food, doctors, and other medical personnel could be sent over large distances. And again, Caribbean is on that one. Next one, characterized by a rapid fall in birth rate and a contingent slow decline in the death rate. Of course, as we get more industrialized, we move from a farming, farming community, we, we move from our culture into manufacturing, which required less people than farming, and then we move to an electronic society, which even required less. So what we find is that we keep seeing our falling birth rate. Increased life expectancy and lower infant mortality. So there are cultural factors that affect birth rate as society became more religiously cosmopolitan. So that is, there were people who were not Catholic. There were people who had different opinion in religion as to whether you should have children, should have contraceptive um, or not. Stage four, um, which is the lower fluctuating stage, both, and, both um, birth rate and death rates are low. Of course, because we know I'm um, coming closer to modern time with technology and so on and so forth. Population growth rates are low and may even be negative. We know, say, for example, Canada. Um, a lot of people apply to Canada um, for, for migration and get through because Canada is underpopulated and so they're also suffering from a low birth rate. Life expectancy continues to improve and it does. And so it is important now in terms of um, stage five, which is modern day. So we see birth rate um, declining um, to the point where it is lower than the death rate. This is what it is in modern society. Um, here in Jamaica, we had a long, a long, um, the, the government had a, 
a long population policy. Two is better than too many. It lasted from somewhere in the 1970s until the 1990s. So we're able now, um, as a country, to bring, the death, um, to bring the birth rate down. And so two is better than too many. Country's experience lost to the overall population since the death rate is now um, higher than the birth rate. It was not immediately felt and will take a generation or two. And the economy becomes the driving force that will limit family size. I can't afford five children in school. I can't afford four, four children in, in high school. So therefore, I limit my family. And so um, the Caribbean, with respect to stage four, I indicated here because, again, any question you get, majority of it will focus on the Caribbean, will focus mainly on the Caribbean. So yes, we, we know what's happening in Europe, but how does that affect the Caribbean? Again, we come back to the issue of slavery and what happened uh, during that transition from the start of slavery, um, which is what, what we call, uh, in terms of um, from the start of slavery until emancipation uh, and, and so on. So Britain was encouraging slavery to build the labor force, yeah, of course and so on, and there was no contraception. Slaves and freed slaves um, live in the proper condition. And so they are there in terms of um, what happened. So, so what we saw happening with respect to our situation here um, in state four to five was affected by what happened from the beginning of slavery right up until now. And there are other issues, issues of health, why we have lifestyle diseases, all of these things, we again come back to slavery to look how this affected Caribbean society. So, so it is important. So as we wrap up this session, it's important for you to understand all the concepts. There's a whole list of concepts because these are the stuff that MCQ mob choice questions are made of. So it's important that you understand the concept. Nothing to swat because they are easy to understand concepts. But you must bear in mind again when you come on to the Caribbean, your history. Very important that you know your history because we use it to explain how demographic transition took place in the Caribbean and why the populations are as it is now in the Caribbean. So I'm hoping that you'll do your reading, uh, you will ask your questions and make sure that you read. If you don't do anything else, just read. During this COVID-19 time, you have full time to read. Read. Um, we, we are hoping that you, you are following us with respect to the syllabus and that you are able to grasp all that we are saying. Um, important to be able to define economic development different from economic growth. We tend to believe that economic development is economic growth. Whereas um, economic development will need growth, but economic development is much, a much wider concept than economic growth. And so um, some of the, these are some of the areas that are in your syllabus. Again, a key part of your syllabus that you, will be, you should know it will, in preparation for your exam. Um, on development, sustainable development, modernization, all of those, gross domestic, domestic product, gross national product, cost of living and per capita income. Um, indicators of development, of course, you must know what GDP is uh, in terms of um, gross domestic product, which is the amount of goods and services produced in a country within a given period, generally a year. Um, gross national product, of course, the amount of goods and services produced by a national, the people of that country, within a given period, generally a year. Balance of payment, of, again, this is a, um, a concept that so, some people seem to have a little difficulty grasping. Um, this is, um, has to do with everything that, is, it, that has to do with foreign exchange, with respect to um, whether we buy things abroad, um, whether we, we, we sell things, whether we import, we export. Per capita income is generally the, um, the overall GDP divided again by the, the population and cost of living will speak for itself. So social um, indicators, health, health, education, health has to do with generally with uh, um, infant mortality, education, level of literacy, um, social services, the, the, do we have any type of, uh, um, of intervention to help the poor. Like during this time of COVID-19, what will be some of the social services that will continue to add to our quality of life? Some people is being laid off, some people um, um, will be out of work. And so what social intervention, food stamps, um, delivery of food to people um, in, that are so affected and so on to affect their quality of life? 
So of course, um, economic development. Um, I picked out Tadara and Smith here because of course, it is, it is such a, a large concept that I don't think any just any one, one sentence can define it. So we, we go through it very quickly. So the, the increase, to, to increase the availability and widen the distribution of basic life sustaining goods such as food, shelter, health, and protection. You can understand the in, importance of food, shelter, health, and protection, protection from the elements and protection from old teeth. Um, two, to raise levels of living, including, in addition to higher income, the, the provision of more jobs, better education, greater attention to cultural and human values, all of which will serve not only to enhance material well-being, but also to generate greater individual and national esteem. Both of them so far notice it is what is happening to the people of the country. So we can only speak of economic development when we look at how this is manifested on the people of the country. And the third one, to expand the range of economic and social choices available to individuals and nations by freeing them from servitude and dependence, not only in relation to other people and nation states, but also to forces of ignorance and human misery. How we move them from ignorance? Make sure that everybody gets educated. And if you have children, one of the things you must do, if you do nothing else for them, give them an education. Because education not only teaches you how to read and write, it teaches you how to think, how to go about making your life much better. So, of course, there, there are a number of, um, of development theories. I will go through them some other time, but just to mention them here. Transition, a nation goes through um, transition, modernization, as it moves from a traditional society to a modern one. There are a lot of things that when we move from our culture into what we now have as an electronic society, an electronic mode of production. And so I can, I can stay here and turn on the air condition at home. Um, I can stay here and turn on my TV to tape a program on TVJ at, uh, at 7.15, knowing that I'm going to be out with my friends, and so on. And so as society goes through that transition, it's important that we look, what are the drivers of this transition? And I can guarantee you most of it will be capitalism. Um, plantation society, of course, we look at plantation society uh, during, during social stratification. Um, plantation society, again, and develop, uh, we had other people before Beckford, but Beckford took it. We, we had um, Best and Levitt, Carl Levitt and Lloyd Best that came up with the term plantation society. But Beckford took it and gave an expanded um, explanation in terms of both economic um, and socio-cultural issues with respect to plantation society. And we have world system theory developed by, uh, of course, Wallerstein, Emmanuel Wallerstein. He noted that there's a world economic system with a core, which are developed countries, semi-periphery, places like China, Brazil, uh, that are semi-periphery, and periphery, most of the third world countries. What happened to food? What happened to goods and services? Which direction do they move? Do they move from the, um, from the core to the periphery, or do they move from the, from the periphery up to the core? Those are issues that we look at. And conversion theory, um, to what extent we find that poor countries are now moving up and converging with developed countries. Because you have some poor countries that have done very well. Singapore is, is one of them, um, and the Lee Kuan Yew. And so, um, so we refer to, we look at uh, convergence theory. And so we, we will spend some time just thinking that these issues of development, some of you will go through issues such as um, mirrors and seers in terms of development theories, theorists. So, um, so we, we had um, Mears first who said that, that you must have economic, development, um, economic growth in order for us to look at um, development. And so his main thing was economic growth. Now economic growth is just increase in GDP. That's what we call economic growth. The increase in outputs of goods and services. Why is that important? If we are looking at, if we have um, developed from last year to this year, what are the outputs in terms of um, bauxite, our culture, uh, uh, um, good uh, manufa other manufacturing, and so on. So we look at those things to, to determine if we have seen any level of development. So it's important that we look at those things. When I come on to, um, to, to, to fear, fear so that we must know what's happening to food, what, what's happening to, um, to, to 
to issues of poverty and so on. So what it means is that development is a multifaceted issue. It's not something that is just one issue we look on, but a number of issues. So when it comes to, um, to development, you must know the theories. You must know what is it that they say. When you look at things like um, the world system theory, I'm sure your multi-choice questions will have um, questions on core, semi-periphery, and periphery. Which are these countries? Um, how do they do? Um, is it that uh, we, we can move from the semi-periphery to the periphery? Or is it structured that if you are semi-periphery, you remain semi-periphery? Uh, is it that once you are a third world country, you remain that way? So these are some of the issues. And so we, we looked at a number of things this morning. There's a whole lot to grasp, but you're at home because of COVID-19. Go read your book. Take your book and go read it now because you have a lot of issues to deal with. And remember, with the multiple choice, you can't escape anything. There will be, I don't think there will be any non-compulsory questions. They are compulsory, which means you must know everything. So it's important that as we go through this series, once we finish, you know the topic, you know the headings, go and do them. Until next time. I'm Arvel Beckford, peace out, and go read a book. <laughs>